Hello AS, welcome to the first part of psychopathology where we're going to look at the definitions of abnormality. So first we're going to look at how psychologists define whether someone is someone's behaviour is abnormal or not and then what should happen is if you don't meet the criteria or if you are defined as abnormal by this definition you should then benefit from some kind of diag more specific diagnosis and then treatment of that mental health need whatever it might be so whenever you're looking at these definitions as we're going through them when you're evaluating the key question you should be asking yourself is is the person who's been identified as abnormal going to benefit from treatment or do they need to treatment is it important that they have some kind of support so there are four different definitions of abnormality and all four are named on the specification so you could be asked for a four mark question uh, explain deviations from social norms or if give two evaluations of um, statistical infrequency so you do need to know all four you need to be able to evaluate them and describe them in the previous years we've had uh, eight mark and 12 mark questions define two definitions of abnormality and evaluate them or the application where you apply them to a scenario okay so this one here deviation from social norms social norms are standards of acceptable behavior which is set by a social group so you might not realize it and then we'll look at those two different types of social norms you might not realize that there are social groups set certain behaviors that are acceptable and certain behaviors that are not and people who behave differently are deviating from those social norms so people who go against those social norms are deviating from them Examples could be absolutely anything. Think about anything that is perceived as a normal, in quotes, behaviour that is um, an acceptable behaviour. For example, and we talk about implicit social norms, so norms that are not openly stated, such as joining the, queue, the back of a queue isn't necessarily a rule that's written down, it's not openly stated, but it's something that we're expected to do, or uh, explicit social norms which are written or spoken openly, so the rules that we have for the green area or um, uh, the rules or the law itself is also a, is a written um, explicit social norm. Examples would be antisocial personality disorder. This, to receive this diagnosis, you need to be a prolific um, criminal. You need to break lots of laws. Well, law is an explicit social norm. Don't steal, don't burn things that are other people's, uh, don't murder. So they're explicit social norms which we are being broken. Homosexuality at one time and in certain cultures was um, is an, was breaking an explicit social norm. It was illegal in, in the UK until very, very recently. I want to say um, 60s, 70s, maybe even 80s before it was made, um, it was no longer, it was, it was legalised which is uh, madness. Laughing at a funeral, it's an implicit social norm, it's not, not written down anywhere, don't laugh at a funeral, it's not a law to laugh, to not laugh at a funeral, but if someone did it, it would be deviating from an implicit social norm, not being polite, not the door, holding the door for people, not saying thank you when they help you, not saying hello and smiling at someone, and then the example of not curing in the UK. Okay. With every one of these evaluation points, what I'm going to do is I'm go I've given you SAD, C-E-D, so instead of um, specs, spec for this one we're using CED so C is cultural bias or ethnocentrism so seeing the world from only one culture's perspective and believing this perspective is normal think about um, uh, the strange situation and the fact that she said um, that Mary Ainsworth said that um, the secure attachment was a normal one then we looked at other cultures and actually they looked they, they looked like they were in secure abnormal but actually it was just a different way of raising children a different culture so there was cultural bias there and you can have a look at that picture that gives you a good, quite a good idea of cultural bias and uh, then we have does it consider the emotions and experiences of the person who is being treated and finally does it distinguish between desirable and undesirable characteristics cultural bias emotions does it distinguish or ethnocentrism because that obviously sounds um, a handy piece of terminology okay so um, we are evaluating first we're going to evaluate um, deviation from social norms so we've got cultural bias so a weakness of um, a deviation from social norms is it can suffer from cultural bias can such cover suffer from cultural bias if used inappropriately so if applying one norm to another and the example here would be in Thailand it would be deviation from an implicit social norm or even you could argue an explicit because it's written down not to show the soles of your feet because that is rude however in the UK that wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily be a deviation from a social norm um, so therefore that definition isn't universally effective and therefore you have to correct uh, question the validity of it and how beneficial it is, how effective it is in identifying people who would benefit. 
then um, it does and it also doesn't consider the emotions and experiences of other people for example an example here is Lady Gaga with the meat dress where she was purposely breaking a social norm to um, in she was arguing to um, challenge um, meat the meat industry uh, You've got to question, and um, in her in this definition, should be considered abnormal. However, they're not considering her emotions and her experiences. She was choosing to show display abnormal behaviours. Um, so therefore, that this is a weakness because would she benefit from treatment? Would she need treatment? Um, is the is the um, definition then effective in defining people who are abnormal or not possibly not uh, and then distinguish between desirable and undesirable traits um, it does distinguish between desirable and undesirable traits we will always use the example of IQ for this one for example some definitions of abnormality would consider a high IQ abnormal however a very very high IQ is socially acceptable it's not deviating from social norm and therefore um, the two de the definitions distinguish between desirable and undesirable traits and therefore can identify people who would um, benefit from treatment effectively. If it does that effectively, then it must have some validity. Failure to function adequately is the next one. And we look at whether people are able to cope with the everyday demands, the everyday demands of life. And if they're not able to cope, um, then they will be considered abnormal. The key thing here is it must cause distress to either the individual or those observing them or both. So it might not always cause distress to the individual, such as, for example, schizophrenia. People with schizophrenia lack awareness. They're not necessarily distressed by the behaviours they display. However, they are distressing to other people. Um, so it does need to cause, they so need to be unable to cope with everyday demands and to cause some kind of distress somewhere. And examples would be not being able to feed yourself, not being able to wash, not being able to communicate with others, anything that you want to do on a daily day to day basis. If you can't do those things, then you are failing to fun uh, then you are failing to function adequately and therefore would be considered abnormal. There is some cultural bias. It does suffer from cultural bias, this definition. For example, um, traveller men are not able to cook and that would be a view or that it's in the culture it's not encouraged that they learn how to cook uh, and to care for themselves um, look after the house because that's considered um, the women's role within the home uh, and so using that definition us applying that definition to them we consider them failing to function they wouldn't know how to cook they don't know how to care for themselves however in their culture that it would be seen ab as abnormal for them to be able to cook and to clean uh, siestas is also another good example if we weren't if we were in a if people had to have naps in the middle of the day in the uk um they had to stop work put their head down on the desk and go to sleep that would be considered abnormal but they'd not be able to function effectively throughout the day whereas in other countries it's it's um, encouraged and recommended and again it'd be seen as abnormal uh, and quite dangerous to work through the heat of the day so therefore we can't universally apply it so we have to question how effective it is as a definition it does a benefit is a uh, strength is that it does consider the emotions and experiences of the people for example it must be causing distress either to the individual or to somebody else to be considered uh, failing to function adequately therefore suggesting that it's an effective um uh, an effective uh, valid um definition of abnormality because um it's more effectively identifying people who would benefit from treatment, for example, people who are experiencing distress, whereas people who aren't experiencing distress or aren't causing distress probably wouldn't benefit from treatment. Um, and it does distinguish between desirable and undesirable traits. So if you have a very, very high IQ, you are very effectively functioning in the real world, uh, hopefully, and therefore um, you wouldn't be considered abnormal, um, suggesting that this is an effective, uh, is effective and um, a valid measure of abnormality because it would only identify people who would benefit benefit from a treatment such as people with low IQ who weren't able to so people with learning difficulties possibly who weren't able to care for themselves statistical infrequency the most important thing here is you want to highlight uh, that it is a mathematical definition it's a mathematical way of defining abnormality based on frequency so always make sure when you answer this one to make sure it doesn't overlap or sound like a different definition that you mention the maths of it so you would say someone is classified as abnormal if their behavior is statistically rare statistically unusual few people display this behavior make it clear that it's a number the number of people so it's not um, anything else it's the number of people a very small number of people display this behavior and the way that we quantify that the way we define it is if they fall over two standard deviations away from the mean then they're considered abnormal uh, for example 
we've got Frank and Ralph. Uh, the average fear rating when somebody sees a spider, a piece of research was conducted, they would say a four out of 10 on the fear rating. Frank has absolutely no fear. He runs a pet shop. He loves tarantulas. He likes to lay down on the ground and they all crawl all over him or whatever uh, people with tarantulas enjoy doing with them. Uh, so he has absolutely no fear, whereas Ralph is a nine out of 10. He's absolutely terrified of spiders, can't be bad to be in the thought, to be in a room that there might have been a spider in yesterday, um, uh, even today, the thought of seeing one absolutely terrifies him. Both of these people would be defined as abnormal by statistical infrequency because they fall out at two standard deviations away from the mean because they vary so much from the mean. Another example would be intellectual disability disorder. If you have the um, average IQ is 100, which is the image you can see in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, if you are below 70 IQ points, then you are more than two standard deviations away from the mean and therefore um, you're IQ is rare or statistically unusual and you would be defined as abnormal and would benefit from treatment. Okay, uh, A weakness is that it can, if used inappropriately, suffer from cultural bias. For example, um, in the UK it's statistically very, very rare for somebody to hear voices and it would be considered abnormal. However, Plains Indians, um, it is stati statistically it's very, very common for people to hear um, the voices of their ancestors guiding them and giving them advice and encouraging them, uh, helping them, their dead, their dead ancestors. So uh, if we applied either of those statistics inappropriately, so we applied the fact that it should be very, very rare to the Plains Indians, a huge number would be defined as abnormal. Or if we applied um, the, the idea that it's statistically rare not to hear your ancestor's voice, then almost everybody in the UK would be consi considered statistically abnormal. So if used in a pro these, if um, cultural bias isn't considered, if it suffers from cultural bias, then it obviously it lacks validity because it's not effectively identifying particular people who would benefit from treatment. Um, it does doesn't consider the emotions and experiences of the people who are receive, they are trying to define. For example, you, Usain Bolt definitely, because of his running speed, falls well out of the two standard deviations of the of mean for however fast um, he runs, whatever distance it is that he runs. Um, however, it doesn't. I'm sure he is. Uh, do we think he's very, very devastated by the fact he's an incredibly fast runner who's very famous and uh, very rich? Absolutely not. So. Again, this definition is ineffective or um, lacks validity because it doesn't effectively identify who would benefit from treatment. Don't think Usain Bolt would benefit from therapy to uh, make him feel better, himself feel better about his uh, incredible superhuman speed. It also doesn't distinguish between desirable and undesirable characteristics. For example, Stephen Hawking's IQ is 160, so he is well above, uh, well out of the mean, well above and beyond two standard deviations away from the mean. Same thing again. Doesn't would he benefit? from therapy and from treatment. Do you think that him being incredibly intelligent is very, very de debilitating? Absolutely not. So um, again, it doesn't appropriately identify who falls within, um, sorry, who would benefit from treatment and therefore um, lacks validity as a definition as well. Uh, deviation from ideal mental health. The lady called, uh, so with the surname Jehoda in the 60s got fed up of people uh, pathologizing things. So looking at what makes people abnormal and instead wanted to focus on um, the character in characteristics that indicate normal mental health. don't normally like the word normal, but of course it's the, the opposite of abnormal. So she wanted to focus on what characteristics made someone mentally healthy and therefore would then, <coughs> if you didn't meet those characteristics, that would suggest that you were abnormal. Um, it wanted to treat mental health like physical health so, that health, so the absence of certain characteristics indicates ill health. So I'm not, be able, to do, I'm not able to take full deep Deep breaths um, indicates that you um, that physically it's not not something's not uh, well with you. I'm not able to use my arms, so it's the absence of he healthy arm movement <coughs> um, suggests that you're unwell. Uh, I'm not able to do very much. I like to, I need to sleep a lot. I like, lack energy as the absence of full energy, so it indicates ill health. And it's the same thing with mental health. So she created six criteria that people with ideal mental health needed to display. Um, if you didn't display these, then you'd be considered um, abnormal. So positive attitude towards the self. So that's high levels of self-esteem, not necessarily overly high, just need to be positive. You need to consider yourself a worthwhile person. Self-actualization. I don't know if you've ever come across Maslow's hierarchy of need, but this is um, where um, if all of your needs are met, so you feel your um, basic physiological needs, you're not hungry, you feel safe, you feel loved, and you've got self-esteem, then you can self-actualize. So you're able to become the best person that you can possibly be. So you need to be the best person that you can possibly be. Autonomy, you need to be able to independent 
independently make your own decisions so you don't you need to not be not go to people and say I don't know what to do you make my decisions for me what should I have for breakfast you need to be confident and make those decisions independently you can ask people for advice but ultimately you need to be able to make those decisions resistance to stress so everybody the small amounts of small amounts of stress everybody should be able to deal with them which you clearly have you resistance to stress because in your GCSEs you're all able to achieve five um a to C grades at least if not more uh, and that was you that was a very stressful period of your life which you were resistant to so people perhaps who aren't resistant to stress might find that difficult environmental mastery so you can go into the environment and you can use it in the way that you want so um, you can when you live at home you use the house how you need to when you go into the classroom you use the house you you master your environment and an accurate perception of reality. So, for example, someone with anorexia nervosa wouldn't have an accurate uh, perception of reality because um, they are very, 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 very thin, um, but they perceive themselves to be incredibly overweight. So you need to be able to accurately perceive reality. Everybody hates me. Uh, well, no, they don't. So that would be, you'd, you'd need to have an accurate perception of reality. Well, not everybody hates me. Okay, and then uh, evaluation points. So it, do, uh, it does suffer from cultural bias. Self-actualization, being the best person that you can be only really fits with individualistic cultures. So places like the UK and America, where you should strive to be the best that you can be individually. Eastern cultures, collectivist cultures. And it's important to remember those two types of culture so that we can talk about, so you can use them in your... Um, uh, uh, later on in at A2, you need to be aware of them. Um, individualistic collectivist cultures, uh, collectivist cultures, it's not about being the best that you can be individually, it's about the whole group achieving success. So, um, Jehoda's um, self actualization doesn't really fit there and the same with autonomy as well it's not necessarily about being able to make your own decisions it's about making decisions as a group so someone from a collectivist culture might struggle to make a decision independently of the group but because that that's not abnormal to them that's perfectly acceptable so therefore suggesting the theory lacks some validity because it can't effectively be glo applied globally and identify um, abnormality emotions and experiences so very few uh, it doesn't really consider uh, people's emotions and experiences it does in some ways but in some ways it doesn't so if you use this, def this evaluation point make it really clear that in some ways it doesn't consider emotions and experiences for example but it does in others for example very few people actually self-actualize but would need themselves considering treatment currently at this moment in time sat there doing your homework are you being the best person you can possibly be are you achieving absolutely everything to your full capability hopefully you are but the other person might not there are days when you don't you don't self-actualize and you don't don't feel, feel that you need mental health treatment so it doesn't consider people's experiences uh, and distinguishes between desirable and undesirable characteristics, which it absolutely does because it only identifies positive behaviours or that list of all of those behaviours are positive and therefore if you don't achieve any of them, then it is undesirable. So it does distinguish between the two. It shouldn't define anybody as abnormal who um, isn't abnormal apart from possibly um, self-actualisation but we could explore that one okay so there are those and then finally we're going to quickly run through the characteristics so you need to know about OCD depression and phobias you need to know three types of characteristics for each one behavioral characteristics what we do our behaviors how we act cognitive what we think and then emotional how we feel and it's really really key your exam question could be explain the behavioral characteristics of depression and you can't then talk about cognitive ones because you lose all of the marks so make sure you know the difference between behavioral cognitive and emotional I will actively at the start of each lesson be asking people for examples of these and if you say if I say behavioral and you talk about an emotional one I will know that you are not taking note and not listening carefully to this bit so absolutely make sure behavioral cognitive emotional you are aware of the differences phobias there's an anxiety disorder caused by an irrational fear of a particular object so it's not irrational to be terrified of a poisonous snake that is pinning you to the corner of a room it is irrational to be afraid of snakes when you're living in the UK inside a house that um, in a room that very, is very very unlikely to have any snakes in it um, behavioral things avoidance so we've talked about this before where we talk about operant conditioning and negative reinforcement people will actively avoid their fear stimulus in every way so if they don't like spiders they will actively avoid going anywhere near anything that could possibly have a spider in it a zoo a pet shop um, a dusty um, built room anything like that and then freezing this is part of the fight or flight one of the things that people do is they're so filled with fear and I imagine this potentially could have happened to you if something makes you jump or something so much you freeze for a second and you don't move and that is a behavioral characteristic people freeze and panic cognitive selective attention so they can only concentrate on they can only 
process things attend fix their attention on the fear stimulus so if you thought there might if you had a fear of spiders and you thought there might be a fear stimulus um a spider in the room and i was trying to give you a lesson you wouldn't be able to concentrate on what i was saying at all you would be obsessed with the thinking about where is the spider what's going on irrational beliefs so for example um you would hold the irrational belief that all spiders are deadly and that if you one even touches you you will die and you're looking at a tiny little money spider that you know for a fact and it's running over your friend's hand so it's quite clearly not killing them so you know that that is an irrational or fear so a belief that is irrational and inaccurate and then emotion so ex excessive and unreasonable fear anxiety and panic so that is what they feel it's excessive it's beyond the situation so having an absolute meltdown about a tiny money spider um, and unreasonable so not very and sort of not very logical response to it depression is a mood disorder and there are hundreds of different behavioral um characteristics of depression loss of energy sleep disturbance changes in appetite so people will lose their energy uh, will lose energy and motivation sleep disturbance they might sleep more they might sleep less so everybody with all of these characteristics looks different in some way but will have some sort of sleep disturbance so they might be able to sleep loads or not sleep at all uh, changes in appetite they might suddenly binge eat and not be able to stop eating or uh, they they might um, not be able to eat at all uh, cognitive so diminished ability to concentrate you we would know when you're feeling upset or unhappy then you can't really concentrate on something so someone experiencing extreme depression struggles to concentrate concentrate and focus on the negative you got 95 in a test and you instead of thinking about all the 95 percent that you got right you obsess over the five percent that you got wrong uh, and emotional of course feeling extremely depressed and unhappy feelings of worthlessness and a lack of interest in pleasure in all activities particularly activities that used to bring you joy OCD is also an anxiety disorder and has two components obsessions and compulsions and we've had exam questions asking you to define obsessions and compulsions talk about the difference so it's absolutely key you know the difference between these behavioral um, behavioral characteristics they are the compulsive behaviors that are repetitive for OCD that could be absolutely anything the very stereotypical one is um, cleaning but it could be absolutely um, it could be absolutely anything um, any kind of compulsive behavior that is repetitive something that you have to do that you repeat over and over again and then cognitive are the obsessions the obsessive thoughts so the same thoughts part of OCD that sometimes people aren't aware of is the same thoughts going over and over again in your head so the idea negative generally it's negative thoughts and then that's where the behavioral the compulsive behaviors come from to soothe those negative thoughts um, obsessive thoughts like uh, my family might die what are my family doing now what are my friends doing um, is one of them dead um, anything like that, something that you obsess over and over and over, uh, thinking about in your mind. And then the behaviours, the compulsive behaviours come from soothing that. Like, for example, turning on and off the light switch um, will make you feel, reduce your anxiety because you feel that you're helping towards that obsessive thought of maybe my family are dying um, or in a terrible car crash at the moment. Selective attention, exactly the same thing as before. You can only think about the obsessive thoughts. You can't put your mind to what the teacher's saying in class what your lecturer is saying, what's your boss saying, what's your friend saying, all of those things. And then emotional, unsurprisingly, extremely high anxiety and depression, uh, anxious because of the um, obsessive thoughts and then depression that they that you are experiencing this, uh, this condition and this disorder, because um, obviously it's not a very nice experience at all. Okay, and that is it. Thank you very much.